It says in verse 17, uh, Brethren, be followers together of me and mark them, which walk so as ye have us for an example. For many walk of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mine earthly things. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Heavenly Father, we, we pray and we ask you tonight and uh, that you would meet with us tonight from your word. And uh, Father, be with our minds and our hearts, settle it. And Father, prepare, uh, prepare us to receive your word. And uh, Father, we thank you for watching over us and uh, supplying for our needs. We thank you for uh, the special singing and the congregational singing, the offering, everything that's taken place. We thank you that, uh, Father, you're God of that answers prayer. We bring our petition of prayer before you, and uh, we ask that you would answer those according to your will. Be with those that are under the weather, not feeling good tonight. I pray that you would uh, touch them, lift them up, and give them strength, and uh, set them uh, back uh, into normality. Father, be with them tonight. And uh, Father, we pray with, uh, be with those that are watching. If there be one that lo is lost, I, for, I pray that, uh, Father, tonight uh, they would uh, come to know you as Lord and Savior. We ask all this, Father, tonight. We ask this in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, so here in these verses from verse 17 to verse 21, there is a lot that is said here, and he lays out. Some of this he even said that he has told him, and often he had told him this before or had mentioned it before. And so Paul, in these closing verses in chapter 3, admonishes the Philippians to follow his example and not look to those who have left the faith or have shunned it to the point that they are now enemies of the cross of Christ. And so there is an admonition definitely here in verse 17, and we're going to get into this. Now, there's three things. Uh, there's more than three. I, just, I work some, a lot of times in three. Sometimes I'll have four or five, but three things. We've been working in series of threes. You have in verse 17, if you look there, you have a follow the faithful. Uh, and then secondly, we in verses 18 and 19, you got flee from the foe. Uh, there's an enemy. There's always an enemy. There's an adversary. We need to be wise concerning uh, his devices. And then thirdly, focus, uh, verse 20 and 21, focus on the future. And we're going to get into that. But first of all, Paul gives them uh, these three admonitions here. And we're going to look at the first one in verse 17. It's following the faith. And I've breaking some, broken some of this down uh, for this point, following the faith. Uh, we see something here in the first part of verse 17. He says, brethren, I like that. And you always want to grab that in your context. Who is he speaking to? He's speaking to brethren, uh, brothers, those that are saved. It's a saved context dealing with these people. And he says, be followers together. Be followers together of me. And so we see the first thing, an exhortation to follow. Um, man, that is hard. That's hard for a lot of Christians to do. And I'll tell you what, one of the things that makes it so hard in this context and in this verse is you have so many false preachers and teachers and everybody else that you follow and they're not they're not there with God. They're trying to take your money. They've been lying to you or they've got other intentions. And so you get a bad taste in your mouth. You got the bad, uh, a bad example or examples, more bad examples than you have good, if you please. Uh, but that doesn't, that doesn't change the truth of what he's saying here, uh, and it doesn't. So you see an exhortation to follow these brethren. He wants them to follow together and be a follower of the Apostle Paul or those who haven't become an enemy of the cross of Christ. Uh, and, and a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of the bad examples that you shouldn't follow, people can't discern those types of examples sometimes because they're shallow themselves. And so Christians will think, oh, he's a godly person or she's a godly person. They do this, they do that and do that. And they look at all the physical things that prop that person up as being something good, but they, they don't see the heart. They don't see the full intent of the person. 
And uh, you can even deceive people who are good at discerning. But I'm telling you, spiritual discernment, everybody doesn't have. Hebrews chapter 5, if you want more on that, what the Bible says about that, uh, Hebrews chapter 5 gives you that rundown. We've taught it before, but if you would want to look at it in Scripture, Hebrews chapter 5 tells you about that. He speaks again of, look, you have need to teach you. You should be willing and be able to teach other people, what is what he's telling them in Hebrews chapter 5. But he said, you, I need to teach you again. Uh, and he says, because they didn't have godly discernment. They couldn't discern both good and evil or good and bad. And that everybody, I'm very leer of Christians that everything's okay, everything's good, everything's good. There isn't anybody bad out there. I'm like, <laughs> it's good to have a good, positive outlook. And that'll keep you going further. But don't be deceived. The Bible tells us not to be deceived. Right here is an area where a lot of Christians get bamboozled. And so when they read a verse like this, they say, well, I ain't going to follow nobody. Well, that's, let's read the Bible and believe the Bible and uh, be weary of people who are out there who are actually enemies of the cross. So he gives an exhortation to follow in the first part of verse 17. But then he says in the latter part, he gives a pattern to follow. He says, and mark them which walk so as ye have of us for an example. Uh, when, when, you, when you say things like that, even just reading people, Christians, like, oh, we shouldn't mark anybody. Well, he's, he's talking here of a good thing. Mark those that haven't become enemies. The word mark in this context, here's the meaning, to look at, to look at, to observe, to contemplate, fix one's eyes upon or direct one's attention to. This is what the word actually is used. It's not like putting a mark you know, an X through somebody. It's actually look, contemplate, and study the individual. Are they, uh, are they for the cross of Christ? Or are they enemies? And so this is what's going on. Paul is encouraging the believers to look to those who, in Paul's absence, uh, they see following after Christ as Paul is, and to pattern their Christian walk after that manner. Not necessarily following everything that person does in particular, but when it comes to the things of the cross, the Bible, and, and looking and following Christ, that's what they should be pattering themselves. Uh, there, are, there are men, there, there are even good Christian ladies. I've read their works. I'm thinking of Gail Ripplinger at the moment, Dr. Gail Ripplinger, who have written good works, who have, uh, who have very strong, powerful works they work in, in the ministry, mostly pastors, some evangelists, some teachers, but I look up to them. I look, what did they have to say? I spent three hours uh, today. I was doing some driving, and there was a gentleman that I follow I really like. He's an educated man in the sense of he loves the Bible, thinks the Bible is God's perfect word. He's a pastor, but he has a lot to say about the end times, about the Bible, about church. And listening to the man, I learned a lot today. There's Every day you learn something. And so I look up to a man like that. I understand he's still a man. I understand what he says is not infallible. You know, or, or, you know, uh, so understanding all that, but he still is somebody in front of me uh, that I can look to, listen, and learn, especially if it's from the Word of God. If it's rhetoric, philosophy, or something like that, you probably spit it out, uh, but uh, eat the meat, amen? So here we're looking at a Christian walk in what manner it is, and he, he lays this down. So we see the exhortation, then he sees the pattern. And mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. So he said, don't just follow me, but follow the others that are doing the same thing I am. And we're following Christ, right? So um, <laughs> you get somebody following another Christian and they get off the sidetrack and they're not following Christ. You're not to quit. You're to follow Christ. Go on. Uh, follow Christ. Ultimately, that's what's going on. All right. So uh, secondly, that's following the faithful. Let's see what else he's got there in verse 18. Look at verse 18. We see, flee from the foe. Now watch what he says here and how he says it. For many walk. Now notice this is in parentheses. Uh, this is kind of like a side note. This is a an add-on to what he said in verse uh, 15 down, 16, verse 17. But in verse 18, all the way down to, to, to verse 19, the end of verse 19, this is in parentheses. This means the Holy Spirit. He's going to give you extra. This is actually, he's going to help define 
I'm, I call it painting the picture. He's going to put more, more detail to the picture of what he's talking about. And we're going to examine this. And notice here, flee from the foe is what I have. Point number two. Now watch verse 18. For many walk. For many walk. Not a few. <laughs> not a little bit. But he said, for many walk of whom I have told you often. So this is something he has said before. Watch what he says. And now tell you even weeping. So this was an emotional point for the Apostle Paul of what he had to say to him. And notice as he, as he gets into this, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. He said, no. <laughs> he's talking about that world, that, that lost world crowd. No, he's not. <laughs> he's talking about a crowd that possibly could be lost inside church. And they might have followed Christ at one time, but they no longer follow Christ the way they should. They're enemies of the cross. They're, they're, uh, they are, have a different mindset. And he says there's many that walk like this, not just one or two. All right, so verse 19, let's read two verses and then we'll make our points. Whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. Uh, a good guide keeps you from danger. Let me say that again. A good leader or a good guide will keep you from danger. And so I marvel that even with preaching and trying to be as clear and precise with words and thoughts and meanings, you still will have an individual that is going in one ear and out the other and it's not catching in the heart. And, and uh, you say, well, why is it that? I, I don't know. I think of times in my life when maybe I had that hard attitude or had that demeanor about I wasn't really paying attention. I remember a few times when I was younger. Remember when you were younger? And now I had parents who were very studious on how we were brought up. And so if my parent, my dad was very perceptive at this, mom was too, both of them were, but if they thought you weren't listening or paying attention to what they were saying, how they were saying it, they were going to get on you. And dad would say something like, look, listen to me. He'd give me that look. Pay attention to what I'm telling you. It's very important. Or he would even go a little bit further when I was younger. He's telling me to do something. I didn't do it. And he'd tell me the second time. He'd say, now look. I can still see him looking that same look. He's dead serious. I'm only going to tell you, this is the last time I'm going to tell you, the next time I'm going to give you a spanking. So you already know you should take out the trash. I've told you twice. Now I want you to get in there and take the trash out. And he, that's, what, that's all he would say. He wouldn't be hollering. Dad wasn't a holler. And you'd think, man, all the preaching he does, he would be a holler. He's, he was, mom was, she'd get in you. She'd get on you. But uh, dad would just kind of warn you like that. And... Um, well, after you had one of those spankings, you don't want to ever, you, you're listening next time. So, but there were times in my younger life where you weren't quite paying attention. It didn't click that it was important. And so here he's saying, look, I've, I've told you this before, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame and who mind earthly things. There's two things under flee from the foe. And I, I'm, I stated first and to note that a, a good guide, Paul was a good teacher. He was a good preacher, apostle. He was keeping these people from danger. And so a good preacher, a good pastor will keep you from danger. A good parent will keep their kids, their children from danger. And uh, you've heard me say it before. Your, your, your parents didn't put all that money and time into you. And then you get 16, 17, 18. You start to make a little, dad says, like flying, flying the coop or flying the nest a little bit, trying your wings out. All of a sudden they give you bad advice. <laughs> And I thought, yeah, that's pretty good. You know, they, they've dumped a lot of time into you, and all of a sudden you get 16 or 17, and all of a sudden you didn't begin to disagree with what they think maybe you should do. Be mindful of this. Don't be over there. Don't maybe hang out with that crowd, or don't go over here, or maybe you should be doing this. Maybe you should do this first. That's good advice. They're trying to tell you something. And so a good guide, a good teacher, a good preacher will keep you from danger. Uh, a poor one will not. They're kind of like, uh, they're not proactive, they're reactive. They wait until the child, I'm thinking of an apparent mode, falls into something horrible. And oh my goodness, then the whole world falls down. They pray, they beg, they fast, they do everything. 
That, that is reactive. That's reacting. You'll, you'll not be, ever be a good parent if you're a reactor type of a parent. You want to be proactive. And so same, not only a parent, a pastor, not only a, pa- a pastor, but a, a, a married couple, same thing. You don't want to be reactive. You'll always be trying to be on the rebound of trying to f- pick up the pieces. You want to get in front of it. And so a poor, a, poor, a poor leader won't keep you really from danger, just one danger from the next, one catastrophe from the next. So if you look at your life and you see one mess, next mess, this mess, that mess, you're probably, probably just a guess, educated guess, you're probably a reactive type. God it challenges each one of us to be proactive means you're going to act before you have to act, anticipate, all right? So here he is, he is warning them. This is what's going on. So two things. We have an example to avoid, and we have exploits to avoid. Let's look at the examples to avoid in verse 18. We'll break, uh, we'll break some of this down here a little bit. But he says in verse 18, For many walk, of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Right, uh, and so here under this, these foes that Paul was warning of were not were not openly evil. <clears throat> they were not they were not necessarily somebody who walked in and said, "Hey, I am not for what you guys are doing here, but I'm going to sit here, not sing, not do this, not give, not worship, not be faithful." They're not going. You're not. I have never seen a Christian do that. I've seen some Christians say some pretty bold things when they're pushed in a corner, when they're either backslid on God, they hate, they have anger, they have resentment, they got bitterness, they have envy, they have lust, and they'll speak out, and you can sense there's something wrong in the heart, but not to have somebody come in through the doors and say, hey, I'm just an evil, I'm an enemy of the cross, and I'm here. (laughs) Uh, They're not going to do that. So, they were not openly evil. They disguised themselves to appear scripturally sound. Let me, let me lay some more scripture here. Back to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Turn with me here and we'll pick up what he had written to the Corinth church in kind of the same setting. And he warns them here. This was something that Paul had done and does. And so we're picking up on this. We're looking at these examples to avoid. And so it's kind of the, the, more of the negative. And he's laying out this warning here. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Notice with me verse 13 if you found your place. It says, for such are false apostles. All right. So some of them were saying that they were apostles, but they weren't. They didn't say they were false apostles. They were saying they were the real apostles. So I don't know if you've... Um, If you've ever been around somebody who says that they were an apostle and they look right at you and they say it in a way that they want you to be convinced of it too. I've had that happen a number of times. Um, And say, what do you do? I say, well, that's funny. And you've seen the resurrected Lord in bodily form and you have lived since the cross. (laughs) So there's two things there I don't think's really happened. So I know the person's lying to me according to scripture. So here, this Apostle Paul wasn't, he wasn't trying to bash him. He's trying to warn good folks about these people. Such, verse 13, for such are false apostles. Here's where he places them. Deceitful workers. They're, they're, not, they're not a type of person who's idly by. They want to be involved in the work. You don't really have much problem with somebody who's not really really involved or committed into ministry. It's always those who are willing to want to work, and you have to be careful. Deceitful workers transforming themselves into the apostles of who? Christ. That's all good and godly, and it has God backing it. They, they want that look of goodness. Verse 14, and no marvel. He wants you to know this and, and myself to know. For Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. You're not going to ever see Satan, uh, at least he's not yet, in a bad light. He's always going to have the edge. He's always going to have that look of good and greatness and convincing. And so when I, you think of the, this man of peace, of what's going on in the Middle East and the world, think, what's he going to be like? Well, I'll tell you this, three things. He's going to be very well politically connected and people are going to like him. And he's going to have, he's not going to be, he's not going to be somebody that's, that's professes 
uh, evolution and what the world propagates. He's going to propagate Christ and the things of God because he's going to understand where the nation of Israel comes from. He's going to understand where the other nations around the nation of Israel comes. He, he will know how they work. He will know how they function. He will know how they have not worked well. He'll know the ins and outs. And so politically, he'll be very, very smart, and he'll be well accepted, not just from one party. So I don't want to look for a Democrat or Republican. I look for somebody who's far above that. We're, we live in a Western world bubble, by the way. So this man of peace is a national man, not just a singular. So he'll be politically connected. He'll be religiously connected. He'll be very religious. He'll know about the religions of the world, the ins and outs of them, and he'll know which one best suits what he needs. All right? And then he'll be a man of, of military backing. He'll have a military backing, and so he'll be disciplined, and he'll know how that operates and how, how it should, how it shouldn't operate, and, and know how to use it. That's the Antichrist. I'm looking for somebody like that to come on the scene. I said, what about Obama? What about Biden? What about Trump? Those guys aren't smart enough. This guy's going to be, he's going to be convincing enough to convince you and me that he's the right man for the job. That's how good he's going to be. All right. I don't think he showed up yet. He might be alive. That's untelling. I don't know. But I'm telling you, he, he'll be very convincing. All right. So here he's laying this in verse 14. And, and no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Verse 15. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers, Satan has ministers, you better bet. And they're not in all occults. They're going to be around the Christ thing, godly things, also being transformed as the ministers of, say it with me, righteousness, whose end shall be according to their, their works. And so we see as he lays this out in 2 Corinthians, uh, Paul did not delight in telling them this. That's why he says in Philippians chapter 3 there that he was weeping. He tells them in weeping in verse 18. Uh, and so that they are the enemies of the cross. I will definitely have to take a drink here. So here's what you avoid, these examples. How about the exploits? This is where it gets a little, let's dig in deeper. Look at verse 19 and let's examine some of these. Uh, Paul mentions the exploits of these bad examples so others will be warned of their destruction. I'm going to give you a verse here that we're going to go to here in a minute in 1 Timothy, but let's read verse 19, then we'll go to 1 Timothy. He says here in verse 19, back in our text, whose end is destruction. That's ultimately their end. So already has that figured out. Whose God is their belly. I'm going to break that down for us. And whose glory is in their shame. I'll break that phrase down. There's, there's another one here. Who mind earthly things. We'll break that down. Uh, and so we see here in verse 19, he gives a list. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 6. This is a verse I don't want to pass up dealing with uh, these phrases that he's already he's, uh, singled out here. 1 Timothy chapter 6, notice with me, I believe, uh, verse 5. These are the verses that I would put with Philippians chapter 3, verse 19. And he says, 1 Timothy chapter uh, 6 and verse 5. He says, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. You ever been around a Christian who has a lot of good successful things and they bank that on because they have success, God is touching them? God can, but that's not the sign that God's hand is on them. Satan also gives things too. And there are a lot of good Christians who God has blessed and given things to. All right? So we have two. Not just because if you ha God's blessed you with something. Some, some people he blesses with because they can handle it and they manage it well. Others they don't. He doesn't. And uh, everyone's a little bit different. But here you'll run across these type of individuals and you'll hear this, this type of rhetoric here in verse 5. I'm in 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 5. From their mouth. This is what they'll tell you about themselves. And so you want to be mindful of that. I believe there was a verse in Romans. Did we look at one in Romans yet? We will. We will look at one in Romans. I'm thinking I had one here in Romans. 
I think I put it in my written notes and didn't put it down here. All right, so let's get into this. Let's look at, go back to Philippians chapter 3 and verse 19. Let's get into this. So their end is destruction is what he says. Their end is not a godly end. It's not a scriptural or biblical end. It is a physical or fleshly end end. It's destruction. So it does not have God attached to it at the end. And so you'll find that uh, the fruit doesn't remain. It's not true. It's not real. Their end is destruction. All right. Number two, their God is their belly. Let me break this down. Their, Their God is their belly speaks of selfish and fleshly intentions. Means they're going to serve themselves and their agenda and their ambitions and their desires before they will God's. It didn't say it ruled out God's. It just says their, theirs are going to come first. They'll spend most of their time, most of their energy on the fleshly things, the things of the flesh, whose God is their belly. It speaks of selfish and fleshly intentions. Let me give you the one in Romans real quick. Romans chapter 16, the latter part. Of, of the epistle of Romans, look at chapter 16. There's a verse here, uh, I believe it's verse 18, and notice what he tells us in Romans. And he, he uses the same phrase about a person's individual belly. The belly, the Bible speaks, it speaks of a, a, a lustful desire of what, what an individual wants on a physical or an emotional level rather than a spiritual level. All right, so in Romans chapter 16 and verse 18, it says this, for they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ. Don't ever, this is the deceiving part. <clears throat> why, you say, why do you keep saying that? It's because I've seen so many Christians give the excuse or complain about some Christian leading them astray. And it's like, you got to look, look at the individual. Don't hug up on somebody so quick. Give it some time. Give it two or three years. See where they're at. Give it 10 years. I don't have that kind of time. Well, we're, we should be on God's time. It might take some time to find a person what, what they're really made out of. All right? For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by good words, notice the context of what he It's not a mean, angry, hateful person telling you the truth all the time. That's not who we're talking about here. We're talking about somebody, watch him describe it. And by good words and fair speeches, deceive the hearts of the, say it with me, simple. All right, so that verse will go with what he's trying to say here about their God is their belly. Let's look at the third phrase in verse 19 back in our text. Their glory is their shame, not God. So here I've got a, I just begin to write things that correlated verses and thoughts with this. Their glory is in their shame. All right, there's a verse. Look at Galatians. We, were, we just kind of finished up Galatians. And so this should be fresh in our minds. I want five, ch- chapter five, and there's a verse, uh, I believe verse six is what I'm after. Chapter five and verse six. Notice what he says here, and then I'll give you some things that help expound this, their glory is their shame. Galatians chapter five and verse, I'm sorry, 16, not six, but 16. This I say then, walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh, So let's get into this. A love. These people who glory in their shame, they have a love for publicity and recognition. Their glory is in their shame. They have a lack of interest in prophecy and eternity or eternal things because their glory is in their shame. They have an implicit faith in education and science. You always go back over there. God... God left you here to, to share the gospel. I understand sometimes we use uh, creation stuff like that to, to, for an inroad to witness. I'm not speaking in that, of that context. I'm speaking of somebody who's totally given over to their education and science rather than the gospel of God. They have a cheerful, optimistic view of fallen man. These are, these are the, the enemies of the cross. They glory in their shame. They also have a shrinking, uh, they shrink from anything emotional connected with real worship. Not false worship, not emotional worship, but real worship. You'll find that they're all for emotional worship, but when it comes to real spiritual worship, fasting, praying, 
getting your heart right before God, they don't, they're not into that at all. And it doesn't tickle their ears. Okay, their glory is in their shame. It's not God they're after. They're after self. They also have a desire to constantly hear or tell something new. This is this type. I'm describing this type of person, these enemies of the cross. They also have a refusal to believe there is anything evil with the contemporary religions of the day, the fads of the day, the customs of the day, the dress of their day. They think everything's okay. We call it an all-moral Christian. Everything is, is fine. There's no moral difference. Everything is okay. We're all in the image of God. These, this is, their glory is in their shame. That's what the Bible is saying. Uh, they have a dislike for sermons on hell and the second advent. They don't like anything that's negative. Uh, they, uh, they have an uh, undenying hatred for one Bible being the perfect word of God. They're pluralist. They're not monotheist in far scripture. They believe any Bible is going to good, be good. It's all, all okay. So this is the type that what Paul is des describing here in verse 19. Whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. It's going to be about themselves and what they experience. Now, let's move to more of positive ground. Look at verse 20, and we'll get into our third point. Uh, we are focused on the future. So we're not to... We are to understand verses 18 and 19 and not be simple concerning this warning. But we also need to move forward and look into the future as the Bible does. Look at verse 20 and then we'll make our point. I'm saying thirdly, focus on the future. For our conversation is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me make some points here. Focus on heavenly things is what the Bible is saying in verse 20 or the first part. Uh, we're going to look at, verse, at Colossians. Let me share Colossians chapter 3 with you. Col Colossians chapter 3 verses 1. Colossians 3, if you're right there, a couple pages to the right. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek these things, or those things which are above, where Christ setteth on the right hand of God. Where is God? Where is Christ? He tells you right there, verse 2, set your affections on things above, not on things on this earth. One of the big things when you counsel, Christian counsel, is trying to get the individual, you probably can't, very few people you can get to see it in one setting. But one of the things is to get their mind off of self and on things of God. And depends on how far you're into self, depends on how much of a contrast and fight and struggle you're going to have with that individual. They're not going to want to mine earth or godly things or heavenly things. It's all concerning them now in the now and now, the physical, the emotional, the fear, the whatever. All right, so be, be mindful of this where you at. Uh, here he's, he's laying this out. Our mind, our intentions should be heavenly. Our Savior is there. Our affections are there. Our home is there. Our treasures are there. And many of our loved ones are there. Why wouldn't our conversation be in heaven? But then we look at the contrast of the earth and our earthly walk and our earthly desires and our earthly happenings or doings. They consume us more than you realize. And they have you wrapped up in the world uh, very quickly. Let me say this. I'll get back on the belly worshipers a little bit because it was a great contrast and it's in our context. Belly worshipers have their treasures here on earth. Their home is here. Their loved ones are here. Their education is here. Their religion is here. And science is uh, are, are their saviors. So they, are, they, are con they converse, or their conversation, their life, is all about earthly things and glory to themselves. That's a belly worshiper. And so they're going to mind that. 
the Bible is saying in verse 24, our conversation is in heaven. He's showing the contrast, theirs isn't, from whence also we look for the Savior and the Lord Jesus Christ. They're definitely not looking for Christ. They're the ones may be singing that song, wait a little bit longer, sweet Jesus. <laughs> that's, that's the mindset. And that's a religious mindset. That, that is a belly worshiper's mindset. There's two things here. Under focusing in heavenly things, on heavenly things, focus on the future, under that, focus on heavenly things, we're looking at that, and then there's two more things, an anticipated coming, look at verse 20, he says, looking for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, 1 Thessalonians, I got the time, 1 Th Thessalonians chapter 4, there's a verse in chapter 4, it's verse 16, I've got at uh, some point uh, an anticipated coming based off of Philippians. Now, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse uh, 17 or 16. Verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. So this is an anticipated coming. It's happening. It, it, it will happen. You say, you've been preaching this. You preachers have been preaching this since the cross. Well, yeah, that's smart. Okay, sign you up for detective school. <laughs> uh, but he's coming. <laughs> we ain't talking about when. It says that he is coming back. Anticipated coming, an anticipated change. There's going to be a change. I'm going to take you to 1 Corinthians, but look at verse 21 in our text, and I'll show it to you. Verse 21 in our text first, and then we'll go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Back to our text, Philippians chapter 3, verse 21. Let's catch it. Who shall change our vile body? There's going to be a change. That it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. So we see this anticipated change. Let's slip on into 1 Corinthians, and I'll read another verse right around the gospel. Where's the gospel at? 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But look at the latter part of that chapter. I want 52, verses 52. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 52, and it says this. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. I, I was getting ready to ask the question, why do we need to be changed? Well, he tells you in verse 53, for this corruptible, we're in a corruptible body. That's why we will see death. If Christ, doesn't, if Christ calls you home, there's a reason. He's either going to you go out in the catching away of the saints, or you're going to go through death, a physical death. And we're not to fear physical death. It's because God says, I'm going to give you a body. When you're absent from this physical body location, you're present with the Lord. And so we know that because the Bible teaches it. The Bible says, the Bible told me so. And he's saying here, for this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. That's why I, I say this. The best defense for somebody who either thinks they're sinlessly perfect or thinks that uh, they have not sinned, uh, you run into these people, then they're not going to die. Simply put, De the wages of sin is, so death is the proof that there is a problem with your physical being. We're living on a graveyard, <laughs> Everybody since Adam has died up until presently now. And God calls people home all the time. Not for bad or good or any difference. That's in God's hands. So death is because we're in condemnation. So when somebody tries to tell you they haven't sinned or not going to sin, that means they're not going to physically die. And you, you know that's not true. Um, so this is what this Bible is saying, 53, and this mortal must put on immortality. So he, he tells us and teaches us an anticipated change. It is coming. It is coming. But we, a lot of times, act like, well, we're not for sure. Let me give you a good illustration. And I come across this. General Wainwright was a general in the Second World War. Uh, he was left in charge of the American Filipino forces in the Philippines. And when 
General MacArthur was ordered to Australia during the Second World War towards the latter end, General MacArthur heard of his predicament and Wayne, Wainwright's predicament, General Wainwright, was captured and placed on an island uh, of, uh, I get, I've been saying it all day, now I can't say it because I'm, I'm afraid and scared, apprehensive, Corregidor, in a prison camp, and he began to lose all hope. This is part of his journals, and it's recorded. You can look it up. So General MacArthur, he heard of this, of his friend, and he sent the special forces to let him know that he would return soon, uh, and the battle would be won. And so when Wainwright, Wainwright heard this, he began to eat again. He quit eating. He shined his buttons and polished his boots and prepared himself for the return of General MacArthur. Now, I'm not saying to polish your brass and shine your boots, but here's what I am telling you. Don't get discouraged in your daily battle as a Christian. Don't lose faith. Christ is coming again one day soon. You need to keep living for him because it's going to be worth it. And he's going to guide you, and he's going to come, and he's going to call you home. And I like what the old preacher said. Some of us knew him, Brother, Brother Jack Grigsby. He would say, look, death will do the same thing the rapture will do for you, either one. It doesn't matter. You're going to be with the Lord if you're saved. And uh, God and Christ, ultimately, he's the one that we are to follow and to obey. But there will be a change, according to verse 21 in our text. And so we need to make sure that we understand the latter part of that according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself, speaking of Christ and his power. He's coming back and he's going to blow that trumpet and uh, he's going to call us home. And uh, I think I was listening to some of the news. I am careful how much news I listen to. You'd probably be shocked at how little news I generally read it. Um, and it's generally uh, meted out source. I don't follow the main networks, very, very, very little of it. But uh, I was alarmed. You know, you got Russia, you got China, you've got Iran. And it's the Bible speaks of that alignment, that axis of evil. And uh, I am telling you, we are, it's setting up very nice. It hasn't been set up this nice for a good long while in the Middle East, meaning towards the end times and lining up with Scripture. And so be mindful, be watchful, as when you see the world as a whole begin to go after the nation of Israel, there, that you need to be watchful. I'll tell you something else that will happen, and there'll be a prediction. It's an easy one to call. You're going to see a major uptick with hostility against Christians. You're going to see, I believe, that you'll see the world will separate the so-called Christians or the real quick Christians from themselves. And the so-called Christians are either going to get on the side of the world or they're going to get back over where they should be. And I think we'll, we will see most definitely persecution. I don't know what level, but I, I'm telling you, if the Lord tarries, that's what we will be, that will be the face. And we won't be worried about ourselves and our little stuff going on. It'll be major conflict about what we can say, what we can't say. It's coming. It's coming. All right. Not want to scare you. The Lord is coming. He says, don't, don't fret. Don't worry about this because this is the beginning of the end. And he's going to call us home. Let's all stand tonight. We'll finish. I'm thankful we do have a guide and we can look into the future and God will, uh, God will guide us. He will guide us. He knows what's going on. His ways are not our ways. His timing is not our timing. We think, oh, where's the Lord at? This place is so wicked. God says, no, <laughs> not wicked enough yet. And his mercy endureth, his long suffering, his loving kindness, his, his uh, Slow to anger, I think uh, Jonah, the prophet, said that in his prayer. It's four things there he mentions. And he indeed is that. That's our Savior. And I'm thankful that he is. So tonight, you might have a loved one you want to pray for. You might want to pray for yourself and your family. And it's a good time to reflect on what, what Christ is doing and what he has done, but what he's going to do, what he's going to do. Brother Jeff. 125.